Welcome to the Computer Repair Podcast, episode number 276, Documenting Customer Systems. I'm your host, Jeff Halish. This is our live show where we discuss the ins and outs of running your computer repair business. The Computer Repair Podcast is brought to you by FreshBooks, the simple pain-free invoicing solution for freelancers and small business owners. For a free 30-day trial, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash podnuts. Enter podnuts in the how did you hear about us section. And also by Ninja RMM, the simple to use remote monitoring and management solution. Try it free at ninjarmm.com forward slash one zero off. All right, let me introduce the co-host. We have Brad Torrey from TTCS Computer Services. How are you doing, Brad? Doing excellent, Jeff. How are you doing? I am doing excellent myself. I won't say anything about the weather because that just is depressing. But other than that, I am doing awesome. It is notice, I'm glad notice how I left. <laughs> notice how I left that out of my. <laughs> <laughs> it's sunny in ninety two. Okay. <laughs> it's sunny in seventy five. Oh, Even better. All right, so <laughs> let's go ahead and kick it off. And why don't you? It's going to go to you and share a tip or story that we could learn from. All right. So um, I've got uh, two quickies. One, the, the second one will kind of. Generate like just per perfectly lead into our topic, right? So, um, the first one is a couple weeks ago. I'd mentioned that I've been doing some housework and doing like drywall and stuff, and it's it's very fulfilling and um, it's kind of fun. Um, so we, that's just been continuing. Um, all of a sudden, in the last like three days, my grandson has he's about ten months old almost, and he's getting mobile. So he's and he's just busy, and he's 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 a sharp little guy and he knows how to get into stuff and he's like figuring out how to get into stuff so i'm like as fast as i can catching up with years of neglect on things that didn't matter and like locking down cabinets and like replacing open things with things with doors and just it's fun because i'm like actually getting this this hair going to like do stuff that i've been putting off for like years literally years um so home home starting to look nicer and safer for the kid and that's been great um, and then uh, some, and, and a little story that's a little bit more business related and we'll kind of go into the topic. Uh, I have a client that's a great, actually probably another of my biggest client and I love working for them. Uh, but sometimes as restaurant folk will do, they light fires that may or may not be necessary <laughs> or needed to be a fire to begin with. Um, so they bought a location partly because of some of the other features of the building that they wanted to use. And then also because it owned, it had a restaurant in it that kind of fits into their, their kind of milieu of restaurants they like to own. So they took over ownership of that. Well, the escrow portion of the deal was got, apparently got very complicated. I don't know the ins and outs, but the two owners had to agree upon a day that like were management and the most important part is who gets the money from the sales of the restaurant. What day would that happen? um to switch over and that hap it was like when they first did it it was like oh my god we got to do this right now and then okay so this place is a disaster and we all know it's a disaster like as far as the network goes um and they had, they'd they installed uh, a different pos system than the one that we prefer and everyone hated it that worked there it was unreliable and we didn't want to deal with it we wanted to put in the one that we use um that required running cable and basically ground up whole new network. So, hey, I'm all for it. Let's do it, right? But I got to get subcontractors together to pull the cable. And then I have to do the full the full thing of like planning the network out, getting the, the gear, get approval, get put the estimate together, do all this stuff. And it's like, go, 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 go. And then we're like ready to basically go. And we're meeting with the owner, with the wiring guy. Oh, nope. Put this on the back burner. We were having an issue with like the, the transfer of ownership stuff. Oh, okay. All right. It's not like I already put like five hours into this, but okay, no, nah, that's cool. We'll, we'll get in there. <laughs> you know, we'll, okay, that's fine. It'll happen. I move on to other things, and then all of a sudden, it's like, uh, I think it was a, it was a Tuesday, and the following Monday needs to be the go live, and we're working with a POS company that is well, you know, a huge, huge, huge dealer, and um. They want like eight week lead time to to roll. So already we're host. They've already been contacted and paid and stuff. So we're not like that. 
Anyway, the long story short of it is to get to go from Tuesday order like or uh, like approach and then and Monday live installing a, ra a wall mounted rack in an office that's a mess tearing out old cable installing new cable and putting the full rack gear in place having everything configured and then having all the jacks labeled terminated and like all perfect and ready to go for a pos company to come in to do to have that kind of turnaround time is absolutely insane it's bad shit and so excuse me a french and uh <laughs> anyway so here's where this rolls in we got it done i lost a few hours of sleep it was fine like they pay i charged them uh, a, a good amount of money to do this, uh, especially considering the turnover time. Um, and uh, it all worked out. It actually was one of the best installs I've ever done. So go figure. Um, but where it turns in is that estimating, planning, and getting getting the money for the, <laughs> the equipment quickly and getting the whole project rolling as fast as possible was really only doable because of my documentation and my estimating like process, it's it's become a process, and I could basically just take a very similar document with the estimate and the and the network plan for a similar location, and just kind of copy paste, make a couple of minor adjustments for this location, and then um, just kick it out over to them within like an hour or two of them telling me about this whole plan. So that's that's kind of the moral of that story, and then we can get more into that as we go into our topic. But right. that was that was a fun one that, that kind of like took over <laughs> the well, entire and, my entire existence for a week. And we could talk about exactly, you know, the, the process that you went through in order to make sure the documentation was right so that you could roll with this whenever. <clears throat> uh, but before we do that, let's do a couple things. And let me talk about something that I had mentioned last week in the episode was I am switching. I'm trying to switch stuff over to the Microsoft universe, as far as office, email, so on and so forth. Now, I'm finding this a little more difficult than what I originally thought, but let me talk about the good things. And then I'll talk about a couple of sticking points and maybe somebody out there has an idea of something that I can do that will make this transition a little bit easier. So let's start with the good. The, I have an Android phone. It's a Samsung S7 Edge, works fine. I added the Microsoft launcher last week. Yeah, I think it was about a week and a day ago. And the Microsoft launcher blows every other launcher away that I've ever had on any Android phone ever. I love it. It's beautiful. It changes the wallpaper to the, the Bing wallpaper every day. It's very colorful. It's, it even changes the, the colors underneath the names on the icons when it's a light or dark wallpaper. The app drawer, let me just explain this. The app drawer is finally, I don't understand what engineer thought it was a good idea. Whenever you're going through a menu, a menu is never, ever, ever left to right. We read left to right. We do not go through a menu left to right. So Microsoft, again, going back to my old Zoom days, their app drawer, when you open it up, not only is it alphabetical, which I think a lot of them are, but it's got this side scroller where you can go down and touch the letter to where you want to go very quickly. And it goes up and down like it should. Now, my understanding is there are some Android phones out there that do that. The Samsung one does not with their uh, TouchWiz. So this, I really like the Microsoft Launcher. It does a lot of cool things. It, you can get to the calendar. Um, it, it's, it's just pretty. And it works flawlessly i like it too because it's also got an app drawer that you can slide up from the bottom and you can actually adjust things like your volume you can turn on the flashlight turn off the flashlight you can add more icons that you can always have down at the bottom of the screen most of the time you can put only four or five down there well you can scroll this up now you can put like eight which makes it kind of convenient if you've got something that you use a lot and it you don't it doesn't matter what screen you're on. You want to be able to get to that. Maybe it's a calculator or something like that. Anyways, I really like Microsoft Launcher. Now, let's go into a couple other apps. So, I, and I've been using these apps a little bit. But one that John introduced me to was the To-Do. And it's just basically, it is a simple 
easy to understand to do list. That's all it is. I have 15 to do lists in there with different categories, maybe work, personal, um, grocery shopping, whatever. I've got lists in there that I basically, what's cool about it is I can actually take anything on any of those lists and swipe and it will be added to the to do for that day. So that instead of actually having to manually move it, now when I go, okay, tomorrow I want to deal with this, this, and this and get it done, I can swipe it over, boom, it goes in there. And now I can be notified that I need to get these tasks done. Other than that, that's all it is. It's just a task list. It's perfect. It's exactly what I wanted. It 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 blows keep away any day of the week. Keep Are you sharing with other people on that at all? Like your grocery list, you share it with your wife yes, or something? Yes, you can. Yep. Okay. Um, so that's the other thing. Now I haven't done any of that as much on the to-do list, but uh there are we're gonna get into the sharing a little bit too, because I'm I'm pretty sure they all work pretty much the same way. Um now. Moving on from that, OneNote. OneNote, I went all in. And now here's where OneNote, I had technical things for my business, like how-tos and different things I found on the internet. And I was making a notebook of things that I might need to refer back to. And also my scripts for the podcast. Everything that I read off on the podcast is in OneNote. And so I was using that. And then I was trying to use other things for keeping some information, maybe it was in a file folder on the operating system or something like that. But here's the thing. I moved everything over to OneNote. I have three notebooks, personal, my business, podcasting. I can go to any three of those notebooks. They've got beautiful colored tabs at the top. You can put whatever color you want on there. You can put whatever you want on that tab. And then you've got this. It's basically like a digital, I mean, a, literally a digital notebook. Again. Blows away Evernote, anything I have ever used in the past. It's just in, and again, take that with a grain of salt because it's what works for me in my brain. And it's, it's how my brain works. I love it. I can find stuff so much faster than going through the files on my computer. So that was good. So I'm all in on Microsoft Launcher to do in OneNote, OneDrive. Again, awesome. I'm not having to log in and go to a Google Drive. I'm able to sync between every computer that I log into, my personal computer, my laptop, my bench computers. Everything will have the files that I need shared to each of those computers. They're constantly synced. And guess what? It is in a normal file structure that I can get to from the desktop on my computer. I don't have to log into a web, a web page. It's backed up automatically by whatever service you want. So I've got all this stuff on my computer that's there constantly and I can get to very easily and it's very easy to find. So I love all those things. Now, everybody knows I'm an Outlook desktop user. Yes. And I like Outlook. There's many, really the, the biggest reason I like, I like Outlook is because I can actually do pretty cool signatures in Outlook desktop app that you really can't do in any of those. I, I can add a picture. I can I can put a link in the back of that picture so you can take you to a web page, my website, whatever. And so that was the only way that I could find a, a way to do it um, on my desktop. Now, there might be other ways to do that, which I'm going to look into, but I just haven't gotten that far. Now, what I did was I added all my accounts, which are Gmail accounts or Google app, Apps accounts, to Outlook.com. And then what I did was I was able to go to Outlook.com, and now I like Outlook.com. Here's the thing. I can see all my inboxes, which is cool, and they're all in one. I've got all my side folders that I can drag and drop stuff into, and it's very easy to use. It's very easy to see what's going on. Now, problem is you can have one signature that you send from multiple accounts. So like I have five accounts on there. I have to have the same signature or I've got to hand put them in every time. Yeah, it's, it's not, that doesn't work for me. I have different signatures depending on personal, business, podcasting. There are three, three totally different things. So I don't use the same signature for everything that I send out. 
So I am probably a weird use case scenario, but that's what works for me. Now, the Outlook app on the phone, yeah, not real good. <laughs> it it works, but I'm I'm finding that I cannot. So I have my main account, which is jhalish at outlook.com. What I'm finding is once all the other uh, apps are, or once all the other emails are tied into that, it's fine. I can see everything. The problem is when I go to send an email, it will only default to the jhalish at outlook.com. Well, I don't want that. I want to be able to default to my business email, my personal email, my podcasting email. And so because of that, and maybe there's something I'm missing in there and I'm going to, this weekend, I'm going to take a deep dive and really look at that stuff and see if I can figure out if I'm missing something or if it's just not there yet. And maybe I, I maybe I've set it up wrong, but right now, Gmail on the phone blows it away. Outlook.com, other than the signature thing works perfectly fine. I'm still preferring. <laughs> I'm preferring Outlook. The one thing that I don't like is that I have to click on each email as I each email inbox to check it. I like it where I can have all the inboxes in one view. So that's a, that's a problem I ran into. The calendar, I haven't even got there because until I fix this Outlook problem and figure out what exactly I need to do, right now, Gmail on the phone and calendar on the phone actually work flawlessly. So I can actually use them on the phone as I would use it anyways, and it works perfectly fine. And then use the other apps and forget the, the Google Drive, forget the, the Google Docs, forget Google Keep and all that kind of stuff. It's still making my life a lot easier because I have everything in one place and I can more easily find it than I've been able to find it in the past because I'm not a digital hoarder. I did clean up a lot of things. But there's so many files that I have for so many different things, it is hard to keep track of it all. So that's where I'm at with that. And I will keep reporting on new things that I find. And hopefully we can get through this Outlook problem. And once I can switch stuff over, that would be nice. I can just run it through there. I do have the Office 365 home use. So I can have uh, you know Exchange and all that kind of stuff for what I'm doing. And uh, I'm doing a test trial on that right now. And we'll see how it works out. But other than that, I still might use Outlook desktop app, just saying, and maybe just use Gmail on the phone because it does work. I can send separate signatures. I can send from any account I want to send from. It's not a big deal. All right. This is a pretty cool project. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. And, and I like organization, so it's, it's something that I can work on, and hopefully that will help somebody else out because I know a lot of people are in the same boat. They're all over the place and they really don't know how to get organized. And, it, and it's hard to take the time to get ourselves organized. Let's take a quick break and we will come back with the main topic. Our show today is brought to you by FreshBooks. A quick question for all you trailblazing freelancers. If you could reclaim up to 192 hours a year of your precious time, would you? Our friends at FreshBooks who make ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software for freelancers are the architects behind the question and for a good reason. By simplifying the tasks like invoicing, tracking expenses, and getting paid online, FreshBooks has drastically reduced the time it takes over 5 million people to deal with their paperwork. If that's not enough incentive, the FreshBooks platform has been rebuilt from the ground up. They've taken simplicity and speed to an entirely new level and added powerful new features. Oh, and if you're doing the math, 192 hours a week works out to two working days per month. Who doesn't want two working days back where they could do something else besides paperwork? When tax time does roll around, you'll find tidy summaries of your expense reports, your invoice details, your sales tax summaries, and a lot more. If you're a freelancer listening to this and not using FreshBooks yet, now would be the time to try it. FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to my listeners. Claim it, just go to freshbooks.com forward slash podnuts. Enter podnuts in the how did you hear about us section. All right, so we are going to talk about documenting customer systems. 
And what does that mean? And with the story that Brad had at the beginning of the show about documentation, let's talk about what it is we need to keep ourselves organized when we're dealing with our customers, systems, networks, et cetera. Um, all right. So <laughs> it's a pretty big topic, so, but it's all on you, Brad, you, do, yeah, let's start fine. at the beginning. No pressure. All right. <laughs> um, back in the day. No. So like I, when I first started thinking about, um, starting this business up, I already had it in mind that documentation was going to be like my lifeline to do this. Um, part of that is because I, I worked in kind of as like first level help desk as part of a larger role that I had in this other company. And so I was like, oh, okay, so the more you know, a lot of times there people call and I wasn't the actual IT guy for the companies and he had a lot of secrets locked away because he was that kind of IT guy. Um, and so I couldn't do a lot of things. I'm like, I could fix this, but I can't because I don't have access to that information. Um, so I'm like, okay, knowledge is power. And um, I, I have like this, uh, this has actually been a detriment. I wish that I, I wish almost that I didn't have this ability because it's slowed down my um, progress on, on being better at documenting. If I work on a computer in almost any capacity, I remember everything about that computer that ever happened to it ever since like ever since every, everything I've ever touched. I can walk into a customer's office and look at a computer, know that they moved it and where it was before and every job that I've done on it. And now, now it's coming to the point like that actually worked for about five years. And now my, you know, just uh, too many things. I can't, I can't remember sh stuff anymore. And <laughs> so documenting is now becoming more and more and more important. Uh, also, especially if you're ever going to have anyone else touching the systems, if you're going to have an assistant or you're going to have another tech or a partner or you're going to subcontract or you're going to maybe the copier guy needs to do, you know, like you have to be able to share this information. It needs to be readily accessible. So the more information you have, the more organized it is. And also the more standardized the way that you keep it, the better you're going to be able to get into that information, share it, use, use it. Um, and then then it's a question of like, Okay, yeah, we're all sold that we need to document, right? But like, what's what do you need to document? Um, I originally had a policy that if it was a business customer, I would keep track of as many passwords as they wanted to give me because I need to get into their stuff. They want me to get into their stuff. And then for residential, I would typically kind of as a policy not because I just, I don't know, it felt like an invasion of their their home life or something. And I maybe it felt like it was past. But then as time goes by, they go, hey, can you do this thing? And I go, well, I don't have that password. And they're like, well, neither do I. And I go, oh, okay. And that happens all the time. Or they just keep giving it to you. And you're like, okay, you know what? I actually probably should keep some of these passwords. Not to your bank. I don't want everyone to know the password to your banking info because I don't ever want you to think that I have access to your bank account. But like to your router, to your, if there's like a passphrase to, talk to customer support for your internet, like whatever. I'm, I do, I keep any, anything that's basically not financial. Um, I will, I will track. And then from there, it's like, well, how much do you want to keep track of? Probably the router information. Um, Anthony, when he builds a PC uh, for a customer, he has a pretty intricate system of keeping track of every serial number of every part that goes into that PC, partly because he's kind of, tech, he's tech, he is, the manufacturer of, of the, the end system and he needs to be able to warranty it and stuff. Um, but he's got a system for keeping track of that. Um, I've shared my IP scheme. I call it an IP scheme document because that's kind of how it started. But then it just sort of became the master site documentation and everything else has found a way to fit onto there. Um, I have uh, basically that that is, so I have three places where I kind of track stuff. One would be that site doc that keeps track of IPs, all the computers and everything that's on the network. If anything is statically assigned or something, then that's gonna be noted there, um, which a lot of stuff on my networks is uh, assigned in the router and reserved. And then um, uh, I have, and that has multiple tabs based on a couple of things. Like I'll keep track of software keys um, in there. And um, yeah, and then the, we already, we, I talked about some of my sales documentation when I do like a proposal or something, I have that that form. 
And then um, I do use Repair Shopper. So Repair Shopper has obviously tickets. Um, and I'm getting more and more into it. It's very time consuming to set up. So it's been kind of a slow roll, but assets. So every computer or a vi uh, IP phone or even like I, c I actually create an asset that is like the website just so that um, I can assign tickets to assets. And then later when I'm looking at like a computer, I can kind of more quickly see the ticket history on that computer. And we can see, oh, well, this thing's had this problem repeatedly. It's it's probably time to either change out the hard drive or replace the computer or, or whatever. So, um, but the whole idea is can keep as much information as you can in as organized a way as, as you can make it and in as standardized as a process as you can for both the ease of entry and the ease of access later. And you will thank yourself in two years from now when you're trying to find some information and you, and you just have it at your fingertips, you will find that that time was well spent. So, well, and I'll say this, <laughs> that was, no, that was a good explanation and you're exactly right when it goes and I'm going to start back with talking about passwords. Here's my rule of thumb on that residential or business. If I'm doing business with somebody, whether it be residential or a business, if they don't trust me in for whatever reason, then we really shouldn't be doing business together anyways. And I I'm like you, I don't really want to keep the passwords, but when I need to get a, hey, my emails broken again, and this is from residential customers, mm -hmm. I need you to get in there. And I'm like going, okay, well, I need your password. Well, there's always a lag time from the time you send an email. Cause I'm not going to call them on the phone. I don't have time for that. And so there's this lag time. You send an email out when they see it, they'll send you it. Well, now you're, you're past the time that you could actually have worked on it. So you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot really in being able to do your job. So here again, you don't trust me to give me your passwords. We don't need to work together, period. And that's quite honestly, that is my policy. Now, I, it's not like I ask for every single password, but when we're dealing with issues, I will ask for the passwords. I will document those. Now, I will tell you this. I do not use Repair Shopper to its fullest extent. And what I mean by that is there are some things, especially in the new version, that you can set things up categorically so that you can document different things like maybe an email password, maybe a Windows password, maybe a server password, whatever. You can make them whatever you want. Now, Paco is working on something, and I'm, I'm actually going to get with him this weekend and a couple other gentlemen. And what we're going to do is some of the stuff I want to go through. Now, he's been sharing some things with me to add into Repair Shopper so that it makes a it makes sense to be able to put as much information as you can now talk about documentation when i started i would get the computer from the customer of course i'd have him fill out the paperwork of course i'd get the computer and i'd run downstairs like a little kid on christmas and i'd rip that thing open or plug it into a monitor and a keyboard and mouse or whatever and i get in there and i go okay what do we need to do to fix this and i'd start fixing it didn't document nothing. <laughs> then you come back later and you're going, what did I do? I don't remember. Well, I don't have anything, you know? And of course the plan was I was going to write it on the sheet that they had filled out because it has a bunch of check boxes and different things you can fill out as you're working on the machine. I didn't do that. So when a customer would call and say, Hey, do you remember when number one, I had to go through a file system, try to find their name, you know, like it was going to be an alphabetic order. Now it's usually whenever, whenever they last came in. I think I recognize that hand motion you're making. Is that is that moving uh, paper around? Exactly. Paper. Oh, okay. Yes. I remember paper. that. Okay. <laughs> so I'd whip the paper out and, oh, and then I, it would have nothing on it that would even help me remotely to figure out exactly what I did to their computer. So the hardest thing for me to learn once I started using Repair Shopper was to stop, drop, and roll. No, that's a different thing. It was to stop. And basically take the information, the asset, take the serial number. If it had a, a Dell Express code on it, take the Dell Express code. What type was it? What model was it? What was the nomenclature on 
the laptop or desktop, put all that stuff in there. So I knew that it, when they brought me another computer, oh, this is a different computer. It's not the same one as they had brought last time. This is a different problem. It, it goes through a whole different series. So I might have customers that might have four or five different computers that they brought to me over time in that document. Now, some of those computers are probably no longer around. Maybe, you know, three, four years after I've worked on them or whatever, they're just kind of, they're way too old to work on anyways. But I could always go back. And if somebody had a problem, here's the other thing too. When I documented that, when somebody had a problem and I needed to order a part, instead of waiting for them to bring me the machine back so that I could rip it open and order the part, I already had all the information I needed. I could go online, order the part, say, hey, it'll be here Tuesday, drop it off Tuesday, and we'll get it taken care of for you. So it made my job that much easier. But that was, I really had to stop and document everything before. I started fixing the problem. I'm still that. I, I still would rather, as a fixer, I still would rather take the computer and just fix it and forget all the paperwork. Forget all that other stuff. Here you go. It runs faster than a, you know, speeding bullet. I don't know. And so <laughs> take it back and pay me and I'm good. But that is not the reality. So when it comes to documentation, even on the residential side, if you want to be able to refer back to when somebody calls you and say, I don't know if you remember this, but a year ago you worked on, no, I don't. So, but it, it's kind of cool because I can click on repair shop or go in there, type in the customer's name and go, oh yeah. Oh yeah. We replaced your hard drive. And even from a standpoint, Brad, of I had to, somebody would say, I think you replaced the hard drive the last time I had this computer in here and I'm having an issue. So I had to go and I, I couldn't remember. So I had to go back in there and go, no, we actually replaced your video card, but your hard drive is actually bad. See, if I didn't have that documentation, I could not have proved to them that no, we replaced the video card last time because the fan was broke or whatever. Yeah. Now your hard drive is dying. It had nothing to do with what I did or didn't do. We need to replace, you know, so it's not under warranty. It needs to be replaced. You need a new hard drive. In, the, in that that way, because if not, you'll be second guessing yourself and going, well, did I or didn't I? Yeah. Um, and I had a one of my good business customers, I worked on their home network. Um, and so I considered that a residential job and I build them separately for it. And I did my full site documentation of his house because that's, you know, and, and obviously it's a much smaller scope because it's you know, just like basically a router and a couple of Wi-Fi things, you know, like that's it, but whatever, it's all documented. I had the router set up and, um, his cable company had given him a, you know, a modem router. So we put that in pass through because he wanted to have his own router and be able to get, uh, access to some IP cameras. So we needed to be able to open ports anyway. So we needed to put the, you know, the, so those special settings for the, the ISP modem were, were documented. And then he sends me an, a message like a year after I'd worked on it, um, that they were having an issue with the internet going down and having to reboot the router every five minutes. And I'm like, Oh, I hope that's not the router that I installed. Cause it was a pretty nice gaming, you know, high end Asus gaming router that I was like, Oh, that I hope that's not failing yet. Cause it's not old enough. Anyway, I had all the information documented. He sent me a picture of the thing that was being rebooted and was, fixing the problem and it was definitely the cable one. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I could even see clearly on the picture that he sent me that I had made a, a, a label on that route on that modem for like, you know, the, the, maybe the spectrum tech that it maybe come out in the future to look at it. It says like this unit's in bridge mode. It's being passed through, you know, the internet's being passed through this. So like, even if you didn't have access to my documentation, you just look at it and it was basically documented on the thing. Um, and I'm really glad I did that because I, even before I looked it up, he sent me the picture. I could look at the picture and I go, oh yeah, that's that thing's in pass through mode. If that thing, if that's being rebooted and that's fixing your problem, I'm like, you need to, if you want me to swing by and pick it up and take it to Spectrum for you and like get a replacement because we have a, an office really like right down the street, uh, I'll do that. He's like, no, I'll call him. By the way, 
he called Spectrum at like 4 p.m. on a Friday. They came out at 9 a.m. the following morning on a Saturday and had a unit in place and had his internet back up and running in, like in 30 minutes. And he was very happy. And I was like, wow, way to go, Spectrum. Good job. Um, yeah, no so, kidding. Yeah, right? I was like, <laughs> that's why I was, I was offering to kind of get in the middle of it because he's a good customer. And I'm like, yeah, I'll drive it down there. I'll bring it back and I'll get it going for you. And he's like, well, I'll, call, I'll try calling them first. And uh, their response was fantastic. So good on them. Um, anyway, but I think that's you saved me a lot of time. It, absolutely. And here's the other thing when you're talking about, because obviously, even on a residential side, you're talking about all these different types of routers and different things that you have to know. And we've talked about standardization on the show. But one of the things is when you're using something like Arachnus products, and the only reason I say those say that is because that's what I use. And with Oversee, once you tie a unit to the Oversee, you know, uh, web browser, basically, you've got all that information there. If you need to swap something out, everything's right there. You don't have to do anything. You're just plugging it in one time and boom, it's on that network. And here's all the information for that. If it needs to be replaced, if it needs to be warranted. Now, one of the things that uh, Taz said in the chat room is he did say also document new hard drive serial numbers. And to be honest with you, he's right. And I never up to this point actually thought about that. Here's what I'm saying. I can always learn something new. And the reason he's saying that, and I can understand this, if you were ever to get into a position where somebody brought you back a hard drive that was not working after you replaced it, and you cannot match that serial number up, then it's on you You're because you're not going to know. And as a matter of fact, I just replaced the drive in a laptop today, and I'm going to pull it back out now. Thanks, Taz. And actually document <laughs> that number. <laughs> I got to pull the laptop back apart. I appreciate that. Well, but, you still have the box? Because it's on the box. Well, it was, it was through Amazon, and it was no packaging. I got the, uh, the package-free version, right. which was weird. Side tangent. Came in an envelope about this big, a, a padded envelope in a, one of those cardboard slider things i knew what it was sitting on my front porch and i'm like wow man if you stepped on that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'd be toast anyways all right another story here's another side this is another side tangent i did not realize this so again i can always learn something new i'd always i'm reading about these uh i i just started using crucial um hard drives ssds because john uses them says good things about them. He's got them in a lot of customer stuff. So I started using them. I became a reseller. I get warranty and all that kind of stuff. Save a little bit of money and not much. But anyways, I needed this one quick. I ordered it on Amazon. But the Crucial uh, SSD came with this little plastic thing in there. And I never knew what they meant when they were talking about basically a riser. It would say something to the effect of 7 millimeter and riser 9.5 millimeters or something like that. Well, the reason is in a laptop, I guess these things are so thin that they won't actually line up with the plug-in in a laptop. Uh -huh. So you need to put the plastic riser, which has stickers on it, so you can <clears> stick <throat> it to the plastic, underneath that so that it can slide into the connector on the laptop. Again, I just started putting SSDs in. I'm, I'm to the point now. I'm usually the last. I'm, I'm the last one on the bus, man. Because... <laughs> I have always, have always had a hard problem with, I know if I install these and people lose their data because they don't do any type of backup, I am going to feel bad. And so, and I know most of, even though it's not my responsibility, I know most of the time, software wise, I can usually get the data back on a spinning drive. On an SSD, it's digital. It's either on or off. And once it's off, you're pretty much done. So if that stuff wasn't backed up, yeah, good luck on you. Uh, there are a couple things you might be able to do out there, but they're not definitely not proven, and they do take a boatload of time. So I was not interested in that. But you give people the options. You go, listen, this, this is an SSD. If it does die, your data will be gone. You need to have some sort of backup. Here's what we have, and you offer that. Anyways, side tangent on Crucial, they they come with an Acronis key that you can use to help migrate 
uh, an existing drive and it works amazing. And um, another reason that I like using them for all but not all but the high, highest performance requirements where I go to a higher end drive. But yeah, Crucials are great. And I'm going to see because actually I'm going to buy one for myself and put it in my in my personal system. I'm going to see if there is a huge difference between the Samsung 850 Pro that I have <laughs> and the Crucial, whatever their MX500 series is, which, I, you know, reading a couple things out there, they're pretty much it looks neck and neck. But Crucial is about $25 or more cheaper, depending on the size model you buy. So, anywho, let's move on from there. Going back to documentation. Sorry about those side tangents. These are just things that pop up in my head. And I just yeah. got to get them out. If I don't, Sorry. I explode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so documenting. So now there's obviously we've talked a little bit about a difference between documenting residential, maybe what you have documenting customers. Let's talk about the business side and documenting from a standpoint of a workstation. What is it we need? To, what information do we need to have on at workstation to make our lives easier? So, for the longest time, I've been pretty bad. Like, um, I've put all of my actual focus of documentation on site information, the network. Um, you know, more often than not, I'm going to need the account number, and you know, however I going to be able to call into the ISP or the phone provider or something like that. Like those are the things. Um, so on and like, you know, backup router config backup. If they have IP phones, you can back up those configs a lot of times and that'll save you some time for restoring later. Um, those kind of things I've been very good about. Um, actually documenting anything specific to a workstation, I've been horrible about. And it hasn't really bit me back yet. Like. I'm waiting for it to, it's gonna, <laughs> but maybe not. Um, what I want to, so when I created an asset, cause in, in repair shopper, you basically like, uh, you create the asset types. So one is a PC and, um, Ooh, per C99, I was going to get to that. And I, yeah, uh, informed it, Matt Rainey stuff. I've looked at it and I, and I probably will be buying it and adapting it because the information, whether I use his forms ex like directly or not, I think, they look like they've got the type of information you're going to want to keep. Um, so that is actually probably uh, worth worth looking at. And I've... It's, it's worth looking at. And, and for the price, you can't beat it. Here's the other yeah. thing. The technical computer business kit in the IT or informed IT. What is it? Yeah, informed yeah. IT. Yeah. Uh, Matt Rainey's documents. They are both excellent pieces of equipment or things that you can use in your business. And what's beautiful about them, they're made in a documenting form that you can actually go in and adjust if you need to. Right. Yep. So you can make that, you can adjust it, you can make it work. Maybe there's some things that you don't work on in your business. He's got a lot of stuff in there. And what it'll do is it will help you think about the things that maybe you, you need. And then you look at some of it and you go, well, I, don't, I really don't need that for my particular business in how I do it. Yep. Um, but I mean, so, but what I like, what I do want, like, as far as I created the categories of, of in repair shopper for a computer, what I want to keep track of is, uh, um, the OS, you know, what version of, is it in a windows 10 pro and 64 bit, which is becoming more or less everything. And, um, if, if it's got a, like a Dell, um, service tag, I want that. Um, and what, so, and I've got like, what kind of hard drive does it have? Have we upgraded it to an SSD? Um, is it a 500 gig, 7,200 RPM, whatever those kind of things? Because like, I didn't care about that until I started dealing with some higher performance machines. And then it was like, oh wait, does this one, is this one still running on like the older platform and we haven't upgraded it yet or, or whatever. And that became, and then, and even just now. I, I don't like selling computers that don't have an SSD in them anymore. They're just, that's such a, a huge, like a simple thing you can do to boost performance a, a thousand times. So uh, there's that. Um, if there's any other serial number in there, you what user might be using it? Um, 
because my customers get to know me pretty well, they'll call and they'll just say, hey, Susie's computer is acting up. Okay, Who, which computer is Susie's computer? You know, so uh, I need to know that um, because I don't wanna, um, I like to have a personalized service, so I like to know, you know, and if it's like for one of my customers' home setups, I'll, they'll be like, hey, my son, my son Diego's computer needs to be worked on. Well, I need to know which computer it is and what it is. And like, okay, well, okay, so that's his laptop. He didn't say laptop, but I know it's his laptop. And so that means it's on Wi-Fi. And maybe the problem he's having is, you know, whatever. Like, it just, it's good to know. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, <laughs> I mean, you kind of... I, I and I actually would like to look at the the informed IT. I'm sure he has some more information that they they track on a PC. But those are the main things you need to know what kind of platform you're dealing with in case you're dealing with any kind of installation questions. You need to know uh, if you're going to look up like what it is or any warranty information. You're going to want to know that asset tag number or the the service tag number from Dell or HP or whatever. They all have their own kind of form of serial number. Um, so and then. Like I said, some of the performance stuff. How much RAM does it have? Are we dealing with a four, a two gig RAM system? Okay, well, we if we can't upgrade that, we need to replace that for sure. That's never going to fly. Um, yeah, I, so. I I think from the standpoint, and, and you're exactly right. In a lot of the stuff you're talking about, documenting is the hardware side because from a business standpoint, and here's what I've heard from most people that do a lot more business than I do. They basically, if if a computer goes down. They're basically pulling it offline. They're taking an image that they have and they're throwing that image, redoing the system, getting it back up and running, tying it back into the network, however it needs to do, connect it to databases, everything that's in that particular network. So it's, it's software wise numbers. Like you said, if you have your if you have your site information with, hey, we're using QuickBooks version X and this is it's on this computer, this computer, this computer, you've got that information where you really don't need to have it per workstation necessarily. But the hardware side, I agree, because I would say the average life, I'm going to say for business, probably the average life, especially on a laptop or even a desktop computer, maybe five years should be the full life of that computer. Maybe we can push it to seven. Uh, I'm kind of sort of changing my mind a little bit because there has not really been a lot of leaps and bounds in processors over the last few years we've kind of plateaued a little bit it's like it it's only so yeah. fast yeah well i notice it in, i won't notice it in a game that loads up and is running in ram in the background now will i notice it when i'm editing audio yeah it goes from 17 minutes down to seven that's a big deal but for most of your mainstream stuff surfing the web all that kind of stuff you're not going to notice nothing it's the same and here's why i say that I'm using, I'm sorry, this is another side tangent, but this is good. Yeah. So I, I I bought a laptop, it's got a Core i7, it's a mobile processor, two cores, you know, it's got two virtual cores and all that. So anyways, this Core i7, I looked at, it's a 5600U, blah, blah, blah. And then I've got my uh, 5830 or 5930, I can't remember, in my production machine here. And so I went on userbenchmark.com. I think it's userbenchmark. And I found this cool little thing where you can put in the two processors or put in two video cards and it does a, which is better, what they have on them. And then percentage wise, where you're at. And so I think when I looked at it, I think my, my processor on my personal or my production machine versus my laptop was like 191% faster. <laughs> now, again, from a standpoint of unless I'm doing some video editing or something like that, or, or crunching huge, huge databases, Excel spreadsheets, uh, doing day trading with software programs that you can basically write and make it do whatever you want. Unless I'm doing some of those things, probably not as big a deal on the processor side. So with that being said, I think we're, we've kind of gotten to this point where everything is kind of the same, but we're all in this area right now where a lot of our machines, a lot of the customers that I see, they still have spinning drives and they'll still, even today, still buy them with spinning drives. So I'm finally, I'm on board. I finally have gotten to the point where I'm going, Hey, let's switch, switch it out for a SSD. 
And here's the reason I say that is because from an SSD standpoint, here, here's the difference. You can get a 256 SSD that I'm going to pay $75 for and charge $100. Or you can get a one terabyte Western Digital 7200 RPM black drive for $63. And I'm going to charge $100 for it. Now, a lot of people, oh, you charge more here, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I, I like easy numbers. That's why I do everything the way I do it. You, you, get, you do your own math. Listen, there's three types of people in the world. Those that are good at math and those that aren't. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So with that being said, I think you look at the, if, if somebody's got only so much information on a hard drive, I will lean towards, hey, let's put an SSD on there. You only need 256. If you're using 100 gigabytes or less, that gives you plenty of room. Anyways, but yeah, going back to the documentation, I think hardware is probably the things that you need to know. What do I need to upgrade? What do I need to replace? Especially the RAM and stuff. Um, I think a lot of machines are probably, I don't know. I haven't bought a brand new machine in a while. I would say is four gigs still the standard or are they kind of at eight gigs if you're willing to pay a little bit more money? I I mean, I mostly am looking at more business machines, so I don't, but I think that when I look at, especially, um, you know, like micro centers inventory, uh, it's, it's harder and harder to find a computer that doesn't have eight gigs, which I think is a good thing. Good. Okay. To, to see. Yeah. Eight gigs has become definitely, I mean, you can still find the fours and, um, what I'm, what I think is, is just, it's so sad because I really want them to start making better use of the little PC sticks for very specific uh, kind of applications. And a lot of those are still like, it's hard to find them with more than two gigs of RAM. And you're like, dude, I don't know what world you're living in, but even, even with a stripped down everything, like a two gig RAM system is, I mean, I wouldn't even really want to run Linux on a two gig system anymore. Like that's crazy. That's true. Yeah. Linux is a hog. <laughs> Anyways, uh, now Taz does say something in the chat room. He said a wire 5,400 RPMs still sold. Now, to be honest with you, there's a, I, I believe there's a couple of reasons for this. It's not about the access speed. If you think about if you're trying to do a backup drive, let's say you have it in an external fixture and you're just using it to basically back data up. Number one, 5,400 RPM drives are going to spin slower, therefore not creating as much heat. And the reason for that, they maybe it's it's a toss up depending on the brand. Maybe they'll last longer, but because they're not spinning all the time, they don't really need to access the data that fast. Now, would you put that as your operating system drive? No, absolutely. Well, I not. think that's what he's referring to. If I want to like pretend that I can read his mind across the internet, I you can still go into a computer store and and buy a computer with a fifty four hundred gig spinning drive okay, as the main OS drive, and that's, that's just ridiculous. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Get out of here with that junk. Well, you know. In okay. So, what is your price point for a laptop when you're talking to a customer? What do you tell them? What's the minimum that you tell them they need to spend in order to be satisfied with their purchase and not regret it six months down the road? Like seven hundred dollars, okay. and that's them buying it directly from the store, not me. Not me getting in the middle. Okay. I just do the the service to it to get it set up for them. Awesome. And so I think even from the standpoint of what I'm seeing is I am sick and tired of working on customer laptops or consumer grade laptops because they're so plasticky. When you pull them apart anymore, the little grommets come out and you can't put half the screws back in. I shouldn't say it's usually one or two that you literally can't. I, I could glue them back in. But there's no point. They're going to break off again. There's no plastic to hold the grommet in place. Yeah. And so now that I have a business class machine. I look at the fit and finish on this thing and I go now, see, again, I'm eating my own dog food. Now I'm going to go, you know what? We're going to get you a refurbished three-year-old model. That's going to be bad to the bone. It's going to have a core I seven. It's going to be have 16 gigs of Ram. It's going to have a 256 or a 500 gigabyte SSD. And this thing is going to look brand new. Like it's never been used. And that's what you're going to use. And people, I think, would be satisfied with that because, yes, you can get those all day long around 600, 700 bucks easily on a refurbished three year old system. I just got one for 750. And I'm telling you, the fit and finish on it is just, it blows me away. Yeah. Now I've got a, 
my 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 personal laptop that I use, I mean, I just carry it in the field. I don't like really use it for a lot anymore, but it was my main computer for a while too. Um, it's, man, I don't, it's at least four years old. It's like, it's getting there. Um, and I replaced, I've replaced the battery because that was the first thing that starts to die on those things. Um, it's yes, almost immediately upgraded it to an SSD, but that's, so now that SSD is like four years old. Um, I did max out the RAM. Um, so we're talking 16 gigs of RAM now, but those are one screw operations on this thing. Like one panel I open up, stick a RAM chip in, done. And like never felt like I was going to accidentally tear a ribbon cable or any weird nonsense. It was easy to get to the hard drive. It was easy to take, um, I, I attempted to remove the CD-ROM drive and put in a, a drive bay. And I don't remember why that didn't work, but I was like, eh, screw it. I was just fucking around anyway. So excuse me again. Um, so... <laughs> Um, you're gonna get me kicked off of uh, iTunes. Uh, that. Yeah, it's fine. We're gonna, yeah, we're gonna. We, you need to delay dump button. Dude. I know. I'm gonna. You know what? I, and now I'm gonna go download the uh, gong gong sound, and I'm gonna have mm -hmm. to put that in here now. Thanks, mm -hmm. man. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, everyone needs that. Uh, anyway, so the point is, this is a four-year-old system. That yes, yeah, some of the little peripherals that help have been upgraded, but I still, I have no. I mean, it. it when I open the lid, Windows is on. Like it's, it, I still have a, a good experience using this laptop. Um, be, and it, it's only an i5, and it's a four year old i5. But there hasn't been that much advancement, and I haven't loaded a bunch of junk onto it. And, you know, so, but I spent some money on it at the beginning, and it's a business, it's, it, the ThinkPad, I guess the point I was originally thinking of was that it's easy to get in there and work on it because it's a business class machine, it's meant to be worked on by IT people that are trying to get in and out of a computer fast and not have to like pull the keyboard out to get to the hard drive, which I, I had to buy a customer uh, a replacement laptop because I did that and I broke it. <laughs> and I won't do it anymore. I don't I don't work on laptops that are not, you know, in that um, like ThinkPad lineup or something where it's just back to the old days where you literally could just pull one screw and open it up and put RAM in. Now you can't, you can't do that on the thinner, the low profile ones anymore. They're, they're meant to be like, you got to get in there if you want to work on it. Well, and a lot of them too, they'll, they'll have a soldered on chip that automatically comes on the machine might be eight gigs or, or whatever. And then they'll have a, an extra slot where you can add it to on the bottom. So I think that's a lot of times, I think the one I have, uh, I, I didn't look at it, but I think there's one, one slot where you can see the, uh, the Ram chip. And then, uh, there's another one on the other side. Not a big deal. I will say this. I was really shying away from, I was telling people, don't get touch screens. You don't need a touch screen. And the reason I'm saying that is because they're such a pain to work on. They would cost so much to replace. But here's the reality. With the business class models, at least the Dell Latitudes, the screen replacement on that for a touch screen is actually fairly simple. And we're going to figure that out this weekend when I replace John's screen. On his <laughs> Hopefully without breaking it. If I can do touch screens where it's on, it, it's all enclosed, or I can still get to the screen with the digitizer underneath, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now the consumer stuff, a lot of the stuff I saw, it has glued on glass in the front, and then the digitizer and the screen behind that. Well, if the if the glass breaks, you got to peel the glass off, and I, I don't want to deal with those. I want to be able to basically swap the part out, put a new part in, and get that person on their way. So we'll definitely see how that works out. Yeah, I wrote your uh, I wrote your your full pause down at four hundred six and four fifty 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 minutes apart. That's good. And so uh, That's why we listen live, everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break and we'll we'll get into the rest of our topic. All right, show today is brought to you by Ninja RMM, the easy to use single pane remote monitoring and management solution to help you become more efficient, more productive, and more profitable. Who doesn't want that? Ninja RMM understands what you need to help your customers, which is why their RMM solution is integrated with tools you use every day. With Ninja RMM, you can have a faster fixed response time and offer preventative maintenance to your customers. Prevent the problems before they happen. That's why we do what we do. This can help you do that. Ninja RMM provides patch management, antivirus, email, SMS alerting. You can be up and running quickly with minimum training time. Plus, there are no contracts, so you can focus less on stress and more on your customers. 
And I like when a company does this because, hey, no contracts. You come in. We want you to buy in and use our products and services. And we're going to make sure that it's going to run the best for your business. All right. It's got uh, Ninja RMM also offers integrated tools that you regularly use. Things like, I don't know, remote support. So maybe you don't have to roll that truck. And you can just log in via Team Viewer and go in and remote into the machine, fix the problem, and be on with the rest of your day, making money while doing less work. That's now it's not not no work, but less work. Things like backup, they're using Cloudberry backup, 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 backup. You need to have a great backup system, and they do offer that. Also, PSA integrations. You want to get all that, the, the PSA, it just that is something that you need to have so that you can integrate and have that single pane of glass moving from one to another. You have network visibility inside your RMM, easy to read dashboards, and a powerful device search to create custom queries and export the list to keep your customers up to date on the hard work you do for them. Pretty much Ninja RMM is doing the hard work. You're just invoicing and making sure that that stuff is where it needs to be. You also have executive style report showing important system metrics such as health score, software added or removed, hardware changes, and team viewer connections. All that information all in one place. Ninja RMM is offering PodNuts listeners a free 30-day trial. And when you decide to buy a 10% discount, take advantage of this offer, go to ninjarmm.com forward slash 10 all right, Brad. So let's go back. So we've talked about documenting from hardware's point of view, as far as business class machines, uh, maybe that's not as important on a residential side when they bring it to us and they go, it's broke. I need you to fix it. We're going to kind of assess what needs to be done then. So I don't know how much documentation we need to have on that, but we, we understand that things like passwords and things are important, especially for your regular customers that are constantly coming back to you. Again, I don't think anybody really wants to be a turn and burn shop out there. I think everybody wants to be a, we have a relationship. You trust me. I'm going to do the best work possible that I can at a good price point that makes sense so that you can do whatever it is you do. And I'm going to fix the problem so you don't have to worry about the IT end of it. And that's really why we're around. So again, you charge a premium. You can charge whatever you want, but you want those relationships. And there's there are people, I don't care where you're at, everywhere that are willing to pay to get things done right. And then you just have to make sure that you're doing it to the best of your ability and that you are doing it right. Yeah, so, and, I, and just a quick added addition to that, I think that if I was doing more hardware repairs, I don't do, I just don't. Um, it's I'm it's more network related, setting things up, whatever, like um, you have people for that. <laughs> no, we just don't we just don't get it. <laughs> uh, but I do have people for that um, in in laptops. I, I've got a place that I refer to, but um, I would definitely document more on the hardware itself. Like like Taz was saying, serial numbers on hard drives. And um, I would probably if. If my main thing coming from a customer was that they were bringing me a PC to work on, then it would be like no brainer set up an asset and document all that stuff and then attach the ticket to that asset because that's what I'm working on. A lot of times when I get called in, I'm getting called in to work on a kind of a more broad issue. Maybe QuickBooks is having some network thing that's going on and I need to figure out what that is. So it's not necessarily tied to an asset. So I don't. So I'm just not great at, at creating assets and documenting it that way. But if my business had kind of was leaning in a different direction, I'd definitely, you know, maybe I'd be less good at documenting the network and I'd be better at documenting the hardware or something like that, you know, because there's only so much time in the day. Exactly. Well, and the other thing too, like we talked about taking the time, I, I had a uh, remote service that I did last week and it's a regular customer. He calls me periodically to work on this was this was a Windows 7 machine, but for his particular business, I was doing a lot of Windows XP machines that he was buying from a refurb place. And most of the time, for whatever reason, this refurb place, they were the, the installs were screwed up in some form or fashion. So 
So I went through and, and fixed a lot of those. But I'll do remote work for him periodically. I did a, I did a job for him. Do, do you think he's already in the database? Do you think I would open it up and create a ticket? No. I waited till I got paid. Then I had to go in and I had to create the ticket. And then I had to, re okay, what did I do? And that, so I went through this whole process like backwards from the way it should have been. And all I needed to do was before I started fixing the problem, document, 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 because then I've got a trail of it and I'm not having to remember it in my head. You know, not all of us are as, as smart as Brad is, and we've got to write stuff down so that it makes sense to us. Um, so anyways, that's when I look at documentation, I think this is probably the, it's the number one problem I hear about, even from guys and gals who have employees, they're saying, I wish I could get an employee to actually document when they open something, when they close something, when they're in the middle of something, whatever it is they're they hope that they will document it right. And a lot of times, I'm sorry, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but when you're not vested in a business and you're an employee, my hours are nine to five, five o'clock, man, I'm closing down shop. I'm, I'm, I'm moving out. I'm going back home. I'm done. I don't really, you know, so it's hard to get people to do that. But even us as business owners, a lot of time, because we like working on the machines, we don't want to do it. And so it's even hard for us to get to that point. And maybe for some shops, you know what, maybe you hire somebody to do that type of stuff, you know, get that information, but you still got to get the information from point A to point B. So there's still communication in there somewhere, but you could have, you have somebody asking the questions and getting the answers that need to be answered. Or you as a business owner are going behind everybody and finishing up all the last minute details and hoping that you get it right. So documentation, man, it's, it's, uh, it's tough. Yeah. Realistically, when I'm working on a ticket, if I'm, if I'm doing some remote work from, from my desk and I've got all this, all the monitors that I have and I've got like uh, my document, my ticketing, I will, I write novels in this ticketing system. Cause I can be like loading something up over here and then I can just start like firing off like notes and, and they're great. I mean, it's like a nauseating amount of detail, but then when I'm working on something on the bench, my bench is behind me. Maybe the, you know, I turn around and it's, it's medium grade. And then if I'm on site, I may not even create a ticket, which is the worst because then I got to remember to go back. Like you're saying, you know, Google maps timeline saves my butt a lot because I can go back and go, wait, when did I, where was I even on Wednesday? Like, I don't even remember. I was just in, in go mode. Oh, that's right. I was at that place. And oh, yeah, look at I got there at four and uh, blah, blah, you know, and then when I left and then I can, okay, now I remember when I was there to fix and I did that. Okay, now I create a ticket and blah, 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 and I create an invoice. And then otherwise, I think I'd probably would be, well, I'd be better at it if I hadn't found a way to retroactively go back. But I'd probably be losing money because I'd forget to bill for stuff because I'm just so on the go and I get a call while I'm driving and. Now, here, now here's, what I, here's what I try to do. If you're setting your day up and you're, you're actually going on site, which a lot of people do, I don't particularly, but when I do go on site, somebody calls me up, they've told me about a problem. I'm jotting it down with a pencil and a piece of paper because that's what's sitting on my desk. And then I'm going to go take that information. I'm going to go create a ticket. And a lot of times, if it's a regular customer, I might, may or may not have them sign something again. Cause I already have an ink copy originally. But I'm, maybe I'll print off that ticket and I'll bring it with me and I'll flip it over and have them sign it or whatever. Then at least I've got that ticket. I know it was created. It was in there. And then I can go back in and add stuff as I'm going along, I, you know, either via my mobile app on my phone or something along those lines. But yeah, it, this is sometimes it's, it's thinking about it ahead of time and not just being in the, there's a fire. Let me put it out. Again, stop, drop, and roll. Let's stop putting fires out all the time. And let's think about the things that we have to do before we have to do them because it saves your sanity down the road. Yep. And uh, next week I'll be implementing a new, uh, basically I've realized that I'm a child and I need a babysitter. And so 
uh, there's got to be a, a one-step gateway or gatekeeper. Someone's going to answer the phone and create a ticket if it needs creating. And then I get the call. So I'm not allowed to talk to somebody who's having a four alarm fire until the ticket's been created. And that whole thing is, is uh, directly because I don't ticket all the time like I'm supposed to. And I'm trying to make myself do it. And I've gotten better, but not enough. And so it's like, hey, you know what? One person, someone who literally can't solve your problem, but they're well trained and they're, you know, customer serve, they understand that you're having an emergency. They're going to create a ticket, which literally takes 10 seconds. It's just that I don't always have the, the, I'm not in the place to do it very easily, even though you can do it on your phone and I have no excuse. I'm just, I'm, I'm five years old and that's, that's fine. We, we accept and move on. We're, we're and, all there, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, there is one person who's going to create the ticket and then immediately get me the phone call. And then I hopefully will be better at documenting. That's my plan. We're, we'll see how that goes. I'll report back. Good. No, in, in, again, these are things that you can try over time to fix any of the uh, things that you have or, that are not going exactly the way you want in your business. You can take that time to figure out and do try to implement something. Hey, maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. But at least then you'll know. And you're not always in the back of your mind wondering, what could I have done in this situation? Or what should I be doing? You don't want to waste your brain power on not having any solutions. Get a solution. Try it. See if it works. If not, go find another solution and move on from there. All right. Is there anything else that we need to cover under documenting or anything like that that we haven't covered yet, Brad? Yeah, I think we've we delve into that one pretty well. Yep. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh let me take a quick let's see. Uh, let's take a quick uh my own PSA. Um public services <laughs> announcement for those that don't know. Uh so anyways, if you would like to support this show and you like the things that we're bringing you and this is benefiting you, then I ask you to go to patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast. And I really want to thank all of the current Patreon supporters for your continued support. Really appreciate it. And what that's going to do is for a buck a show, four bucks a month at the most, that's going to get you into the secret Facebook group. And what I love about this group is it's a safe group. It's a small group right now, and which, which I kind of like, but there are questions being asked and answered without people being ridiculed, which I think is awesome. Now, maybe, you know, sometimes there, there are people that they're asking questions sincerely, like, hey, I'm not sure what you meant by this. And then there's other people coming back and going, hey, here's, here's, what, here's what they meant, blah, blah, blah. And so it's, kind, it's a nice, safe environment that you can be involved in and get more help in your IT business. I know Brad's there. I'm there. John's there. Paco's there. We've got a lot of great people in that group that are really helping each other, especially when things come up. And man, there are some, there are always oddball things that come up in your business. And it's nice to have a place to go that you're able to get the information that you need in order to, I mean, hey, we could all go out and use our Google Foo. But the reality is, what I've noticed over the past few years, Google Foo is really not as good as it used to be because there's so many people that write so much junk out on the internet that you end up going down 50 rabbit trails before you find the nugget of information that you actually need. Now, what I've tried to do in the past is I've always tried to basically document whatever the fix that I use for this particular problem and put it in my OneNote notebook. Before that, when I first started back in 1999, and I used to call, a lot of people know the story, I used to call Dell Support. They were based in Texas. I would wait till about one or two o'clock in the morning. And it was a little earlier for those guys, but they were bored to tears. And the help desk guys would sit there and talk to me. And I'd say, how do I do this? And this was back when, you know, Windows 98 and all that. And they would give me the commands to do to reinstall an operating system, to fix a problem. And what I would do is I would jot those things down 
whatever commands they gave me onto a three by five cards. And I had a whole file folder full of three by five cards. Talk about documentation, old school. And so whenever I had that problem again, man, I could pull that those three by five cards out of the folder and find that command line that I needed in order to fix the problem. And I didn't need to call them that, but that's what I used to do back in the day. So I still continue to try to do that when I do find a fix, because here's what I found. And I found this more times than not is once I found a fix six months later, go back and try to find that fix. Not real easy. So it's better to copy and paste it at that point and document it to have that information in case you run into it again. And this is the information that we can share in this group. And that's what I like about it because a lot of people have a lot of different inf information that they can share. And we, we have a lot of good knowledge. Again, like John Dubinsky always says, the one thing he knows for sure, he doesn't know everything. And I can tell you he doesn't. But anyways, John's not here. <laughs> <laughs> so when he listens to this podcast, he'll know I'll throw him under the bus again. But anyways. Uh, <laughs> I will not be a part of this again, Jeff. I made up hot water with John on it last time. Oh, yeah. He yelled at you last time. That was awesome. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, let's go ahead. and. Uh, but I appreciate all the support of our Patreon supporters. Again, if you'd like to support what we're doing over here, patreon.com forward slash computer repair podcast, we would really, really appreciate it. And hopefully, we're, we've got a couple goals that we want to get up to so that we can start doing some cool things with the audience, which I think will be real cool. We want to do some giveaways and stuff like that and buy hardware, software, and try to, uh, you know, get some stuff out there that maybe people uh, don't use because it, the cost is prohibitive or, or whatever, stuff like that. So anyways, let's go. And I think we have an email. All right. So this is, this email says, Jeff. I love listening to your show, but I don't run a computer repair business. <gasps> Somebody listens to the show that doesn't run a computer repair business. Do tell. There's a lot more people than you think that just like the content. And here's why. He says, I just tinker with them at home and know enough to be dangerous. LOL. That, that's the same thing for all of us. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm eavesdropping when I listen to the show. I'm a petroleum engineer and love what I do, but I like hearing others who love what they do especially in the computer tech industry. That's awesome. You know, the passion, hopefully, that we bring to the show to help others comes across, and it sounds like it is for even a person that doesn't do something in this business in particular. And they're an engineer. All right, I stumbled upon PodNuts a couple of years ago and really enjoy the shows that you all put together. It's fun hearing others talk about what they're passionate about. There's something that I'd like some information on. What is the best way to set up a budget home small business Wi-Fi network? There is no best way. All right, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I That's see for my opinion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I see these home Wi-Fi systems like Google, TP-Link, and others. Is that the best value, or just using a single large Wi-Fi router and a couple of extenders? I've only just started listening to the show again after several month hiatus, so you all might have covered this one. Thank you, Jeff. You know, I'm not talking about myself. This is another Jeff. So thanks, Jeff, for the email, and appreciate that you appreciate what we're doing here. As far as the Wi-Fi, here's what I've here's what I've learned. I, I I don't even like saying stuff like that. I live in a 2,400 square foot home, okay, and whatever. It's a lot of people. That's ah, a big. Home. I got five kids. Anyways, I live in this home, and I have my router in my 10 by 10 office, which is kind of centered in the middle of the house. And what I would notice with consumer grade routers most of the time, and this is not just here in other homes I've lived in, the consumer, you would have dead spots. I literally would have dead spots going, even though I'm in the middle, I'm up high. You would think you could get everywhere from the top floor. I live in a colonial to the basement. And the thing is, that's not always true. So it's kind of a pain and it doesn't matter how many antennas the thing has on it. Um, you, you know, especially the ones with the, with the movable antennas where, Hey, just point it and you can triangulate your, your yeah, signal, sure. which is a bunch of malarkey and, and we're not engineers. We, I, I don't know how to triangulate. You just move stuff around. Hey, is that any better? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. So what I, in 
this goes back to my old stereo days when I used to have separate equipment for everything. You had the receiver, you had the amplifier, you had the cassette deck. <laughs> yes, that's a cassette. You had the, we did have a DVD or not a DVD, a CD player. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And I, and it was a five disc CD, CD player. It was bad. Oh, to go rotate yeah. Around. oh yeah, it was cool. Yes. So I went back to a one receiver hooked up to a bunch of speakers hooked into my TV. Cause I just wanted to simplify. I don't want all that stuff. So now that's what I wanted with my home base router, but they don't work that great. They work. Okay. They're good for about four years. I guarantee every, every single time I paid upwards of $200 plus for each of these routers in four years max. Cause it year three was when I started having signal degradation, different problems going on. And it was just a mess. So I would sit there and I, I do what everybody does. Well, let's reset the route. Yeah, that's awesome. Until you've done it for the 52nd time and you're just going, what am I doing? Let me just go out and spend more money on another route. So with all that being said, I have gone back to the separation of church and state. Oh, that's a different subject. I'm, I'm going back to separating the router and the Wi-Fi. And so again, I use Arachnus equipment. Uh, I, I don't want to, I can't say the prices, but uh, if you ask me via email, I can send you that information. Anyways, uh, with the Arachnus routers, you can get a router, which is just a box, and it routes all your all your addresses, all your IP addresses to all your equipment. And then you get a Wi-Fi. It looks like a smoke detector, I guess is the best way to put it. And I get the 300 series, so I get the, you know, I get the 5 gigahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz network. I can separate things out. I can have separate SSIDs. I can have my IoT devices on one and other things on, you know, guests on another and my own computers on one thing and maybe my TV and entertainment stuff on another. You set it up however you want. That little box with no antennas sticking out of it, sitting in the same office will cover from my front street to the back of the my yard where the woods are at and anywhere in between from upstairs to downstairs absolutely no problem again superior equipment is just doing a much better job than the consumer grade router that looks cool and has a bunch of cool antennas and looks like an alien invasion but doesn't really work that well now, a lot of people, are, they, they might have good luck with these, but again, I think these things wear out prematurely, personally, and that's just what I found. Brad? Yeah, all right. So, um, not, I'm not going to, I pretty much agree with what you're saying. So, if I, it depends on what I'm trying to do, but I generally will advocate the same thing. I, I don't think you want to put everything onto one device. You've got, um, Let's say you do have a dead spot. Now you need two Wi-Fi access points to cover it. You don't want to split your Wi-Fi and have to have like SSID one over here and SSID two over there and have to like manually be switching it around. You want a mesh system that was designed to be passed around and roamed to begin with. And uh, there's almost no property where you're pro- where that's not going to be something that you want to do anymore. I just if you want to have good Wi-Fi, you want a mesh system. So whatever that happens to be for you, um, I um, I haven't used the Arachnus ones, but I'm hearing more and more good things. And I do already use their switches, which I really like. Um, their L2 uh, managed switches are really cool. Um, so I will be looking into those. But I do like Ubiquiti. I have a lot of Ubiquiti access points out. Those are not necessarily for the faint of heart to set up. They're not hard, but they take a little, you know, I don't know. They just... Oftentimes, I end up having to SSH into the box and, and throw a command at it to get it to uh, connect to the the home server or the command and control server, which I do host at AWS. So I guess, yeah, no, that's there's a lot of... <laughs> it's not just like, hey, turn it on and fire it up. There's some... like I, may, I actually do have to manage a Linux server on AWS and all my uni, uh, Unify devices connect back to that. But then from there, once I got that set up, the maintenance has been almost zero and it's, you know, but that's a lot of work if that's not something you're going to do. So maybe Ubiquity isn't for the casual person, but um, and Arachnus, all of the all of the overseas products, 
are like just what's the serial number of the device plug it into your dashboard and boom they're talking and um and that i do really enjoy that system especially for watt boxes and the uh, the switches but um but yeah i think yes i do have one home that i remember setting up and it was like the asus tarantula um i'm looking at it it's an ac5300 and that thing is i mean it does cover that property but it's a single story small dwelling and it's in the center of the building and it's it works but if i have my preferences i'd rather get you know a moderately priced router probably something if i the lowest grade router i like to i will do is like an asus rt ac whatever it's about 100 bucks and i disable wi-fi on it and i put in a mesh wi-fi system um but i would look at the the arachnus ones i have used the uh edge router x it's like 50 bucks um again not for the faint of heart to set up it's not like a log in and just like turn on a couple of things dhcp is not enabled out of the box like you basically are creating i think they modeled it after a cisco so it kind of takes into that account of like some of the network like you really need to know how to set it up and i literally had to youtube it so they're cool they're cheap and they're powerful for what they do but they do take some tinkering and knowledge to set them up but i've got a couple running in restaurants where they were like we we kind of have an ongoing project of, of things we're going to do for them and so that we didn't want to spend a lot of money on a router right away and i was like eh, just throw it in there 50 bucks whatever we'll see if it works and they're still running actually really well nice so uh they'll be replaced but um yeah i think we're kind of on the same page i think routing should be routing and wi-fi should be wi-fi and well and the other thing too is if you if i looked at my consumer grade higher end router slash Wi-Fi boxes between the, the the cost for the Arachnus router and the middle tier Wi-Fi access point. Um, basically it wasn't, it wasn't much more than getting that consumer grade router. And yeah. to be honest with you, because I have them resetting themselves once a week, I, I just, I don't have the issues that I used to have. Dad, Wi-Fi. We're not getting Wi-Fi. I, I just I don't hear that anymore. The stuff yeah. just it, re, it reboots itself on its own. It does its own thing, and every once in a blue moon, I might have something come up. Um, but usually that's the product and not necessarily the the router. Now, uh, John did say that. Uh, that did Jeff say IoT devices? Oh my God. Yeah, you know what? Because here's the thing. Although I don't like three letter acronyms, I hate Internet of Things even more. That's why I won't say that. <laughs> so that's just me. Hey, IoT. Um, one day I will come up with a better name for that. I just have not found one yet. And I'm, you know, I'm really getting into these products. I'm just a little upset that I have to have three pieces of software, mobile apps on my phone in order to work with all three major things that i have and actually i have more than that four so I, you know this whole one house single pane of glass i just i it's irritating anyways another side tangent i'm not going to go there all right yeah, we're because no, i'm gonna go there but we're, <laughs> we're almost out of here so why don't you go ahead and give one parting thought and let people know where they can find you uh well i i was put in mind of this the other day i think uh referrals are the best uh, you can't you can't beat a referral no matter marketing um you know if if somebody that that person trusts says that they trust you then then it's a match made and you know it's it's going to be a lot easier for that to, to earn that business but be careful with referrals um i have recently a salesperson for a large pos vendor has decided that uh, he wants to refer me out to his clients for some of the like the the networking side that they don't directly deal with, and that's fantastic because it's a perfect met. Um, it, there's no conflict of interest. Uh, we don't we don't cross over on on things that our businesses do. Everything is perfect about it, except 
that he kind of oversells it on both sides and he kind of doesn't directly say that I don't work for them and he kind of doesn't like vet them necessarily that they really need or want so he's like this my my stuff so then I'm having to now kind of do some triaging and and when I talk to them I go hey just so you know like I'm not directly affiliated um is this something are you think i'm just kind of doing a side assessment because it's part of this thing or are you trying to hire like do you really want to hire an it person to manage this stuff because i drove i i did recently i made a decent drive um ba like basically the limits of within what i would call my service area like the very extreme limits and um it turned out that th it wasn't they were not clear as to what my intentions were for being there and like how the arrangement was going to be. And I'm pretty sure that's not going to go anywhere. And it was a day that I couldn't really afford to burn two hours. And I had to, because I thought this meeting was going to be more fruitful than it was. And um, anyway, vet your referrals in a way that's very open and honest. Hey, what are we, you know, what are our goals before we just go have this, this random meeting that you might think even is included in your POS purchase with this other company that really has nothing to do with me. I'm just a referred out subcon, you know, not even a subcontractor. I'm an independent IT company. Are you know, so cover your, um, make good use of your time. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So my one parting thought is do like John and take a vacation every once in a while. If you're not taking, if you can't take a vacation, you're doing it wrong. That's all I'm going to say about that. So yeah, definitely need to get that time away. And it's very important to rest and relax that brain. Even though I know it's, it takes, uh, it takes all of us probably a little bit of time to unwind from the day to day. I know it takes me almost a couple of days really to unwind from just the stuff I do on a regular basis. It's, it's amazing. But then once I get to that third day, it's like, whoo. It's kind of nice. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to do anything. I just lay here like a whatever and just kind of hang out. All right. You guys can come join us live for the Computer Repair Podcast every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern over at podnets.com forward slash CRP live. Join in on a conversation by hanging out in the chat room. You can send an email to podnets at podnets.com. And if you'd like to be a guest, go ahead and send an email over there or leave a voicemail at 734. 335-1000. I want to thank everyone for listening and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time on the Computer Repair Podcast.